Chapter 8. The General is a Spy Some time after General Benedict Arnold took command in Philadelphia, he sent for Joseph Stansbury, a local merchant who was despised by patriots. Why, Philadelphians wondered, would Arnold want to have anything to do with Stansbury? He was a hated Tory. Before the British occupied the city, Stansbury taunted patriots by singing God Save the King, urging them to join him in the chorus. He was arrested for his Tory activities and briefly jailed. When the Redcoats marched into Philadelphia, the Patriots despised Stanbury even more because he went to work for the British, doing various jobs for General Howe. To Stanbury's surprise, he later wrote, Arnold communicated to me, under a solemn obligation of secrecy, his intention of opening his services to the Commander-in-Chief of the British forces. In other words, Arnold wanted to be a double agent for the British. Arnold, a, Br a spy for the British? Stansbury could hardly believe it. Arnold was a brave and faithful soldier. He'd run away from home at the age of 14 to fight in the French and Indian War. He had joined the Continental Army as a colonel and had led soldiers to victories at Fort Ticonderoga and at Saratoga. He had twice been wounded in battles against the British. Washington considered Arnold to be his finest battlefield commander. Limping from his wounds, Arnold could, ho could not hold a field command, so Washington had put him in charge of American forces in Philadelphia. Arnold lived grandly, holding parties and spending money far beyond his soldier pay. Arnold needed money to live in a mansion and keep his stylish new bride happy. She was the beautiful 19-year-old Peggy Shippen. The daughter of a wealthy Tory family, she was also a close friend of Major John Andre, England's Chief of Intelligence in America. Complaints from Congress about Arnold piled up. A military court found that his greed for money and power had led to his involvement in shady deals. After meeting with Arnold, Stansbury later wrote, I went secretly to New York and contacted Andre. Andre used Stansbury as a cutout, a person who links the agent and the case officer. By using a cutout, Andre could stay in New York and never be caught in the company of his agent. Andre, through Stansbury, taught Arnold to write in invisible ink and to use a book code, a tough code to break. The code was based on a well-known book owned by both Andre and Arnold, Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England. As Andre explained the code, three numbers make a word. The first number is the page of the book, the second is the line on that page, and the third is the word on that line, counting from the left. 293.9.7, for example, directs Andre to page 293, line 9, word 7. Not every word was put to numbers. That was the tricky part of the code. If someone happened to see a letter written by Arnold or Andre, it would look like the kind of coded letter that merchants would normally write to keep their business secrets from being learned by com competitors. For instance, Arnold would not write out Stansbury's name. He would just write Mr. S, and Andre would fill in the rest. Here is part of a letter from Arnold to Andre. I, 293.9.7, to C, T, 103.8.2, the 7th, 152.9.17, that A, F, 112.9.17 and 22.8.29 were 105.9.50 to 49.71 and 62.8.20 with 163.8.19 a 22.8.19 at with 230.8.13 263.8.17 I gave Mr. S. Y. A 164.8.16 147.8.261 to B 209.9.216 in C. A. Andre, using his copy of the book, would decode the numbers. In the decoded version, letters inside the bracket show how Andre would finish the words where only the first letter had been given. I wrote to Captain Beckwith on the 7th of June that a F, French, fleet and army were expected to act in conjunction with the A, American, army.
At the same time, I gave Mr. S. Stansbury a manifesto intended to be published in C. Canada. Arnold passed the British many secrets, such as how many French troops were landing in America and where and when they were landing. He also revealed an American-French deception plan, the manifesto mentioned in the letter, that was supposed to make the British expect an invasion of Canada. But when Arnold told them that he was to take command of the fort at West Point, the British knew they had a man who could give them the most important military post in America. West Point guarded the Hudson River, a prize that the Americans held and the British desperately wanted. British generals saw West Point as a key to victory. At a, a glance at a military map shows why. The fortress stood high on a stood on a high bluff on a sharp curve of the river about 50 miles north of New York City. From its heights, West Point looked down on smaller forts on both sides of the river. Stretched across the Hudson was an enormous iron chain that blocked enemy warships. As long as the West Point complex of forts was held by the Americans, its guns would keep enemy ships from ascending the river. If the British held West Point, they could cut off the northeastern colonies from the others. Washington had hoped that Arnold would be able to take command of combat troops, but Arnold, claiming that his old wounds still kept him from battle duty, successfully pleaded for command of West Point. As soon as he got the post, he offered to arrange the surrender of West Point to the British for 20000 a sum equal to well over $1 million today. Anxious to make the deal, Arnold insisted on a personal meeting with Andre, a very dangerous move, especially for the case officer. Such a move has to be arranged in a complicated way, with cutouts, coded letters, and a safe house, a place where the case officer and his agent will not be detected by counter-spies. Each step along the way is risky, because the enemy's counterintelligence officers often notice some little slip that leads to capture. <clears throat> Washington learned from some of his agents operating in New York that some secret expedition is in contemplation, the success of which depends altogether on its being kept a secret. That bit of information did not help very much, until afterward, when Washington and the others realized the secret expedition was the seizing of West Point by the British as soon as Arnold betrayed it. Arnold tried to learn the identities of American agents in New York by writing first to Washington and then to one of his officers. Neither one would help him because of a basic spy law. Give information only to those with a need to know. Arnold was not one of those people. Major Benjamin Talmadge, who was running New York's Culpa Ring, heard about Arnold's inquiries. He certainly must have become suspicious, especially when he got a letter from Arnold saying that a Mr. John Anderson, a person I expect from New York, should be given an escort and taken to Arnold. Talmadge had, had to wonder why Arnold was running his own agent in New York. Meanwhile, Arnold arranged for a boat, under a flag of truce, to take a Tory woman and her children across the Hudson to an area held by the British. The woman carried a letter to Andre, asking him to come to West Point disguised as a merchant named John Anderson. Andre refused, for he was well aware that if he disguised himself, he could be hanged as a spy. If he was captured in a uniform, he would live as a prisoner of war. 